Good morning, everyone. Hopefully you can all hear me. And it's 10.30, so I figure we should make a start. We've got about 100 people online, which is fantastic. Um, Joe is sharing the one-time codes. Thank you for that. And with a bit of luck, you can see my slides. So welcome to your second of these mental health lectures in your second year. Last week we had the lecture with myself and Tom Smith, No Health Without Mental Health, which is now available online. This is a follow up to that and it's uh, it's an important talk. Um, it can be a difficult talk to, to listen to and I'll come to that and some safeguarding um, issues around that and how we might look after you as students. And this is a particularly uh, topical subject that we need to make sure that we, we cover throughout the course and return to so that you as future doctors can feel confident in engaging with this subject um, within your clinical practice. So I've met most of you before online or in person. My name is Dr Rory Conn. I'm a consultant child psychiatrist and I work in uh, paediatric liaison, which means I'm at the interface of physical and mental health and often on the paediatric ward in Exeter. I'm also undergraduate lead for psychiatry along with Tom Smith for the University of Exeter Medical School. Uh, I'm very passionate about teaching and you can have a look at my website connectedchildhealth.com in which I've put a whole section of resources uh, for students who are studying psychiatry. Also follow me on Twitter if that's a thing that you do. My handle is at Rory Con, and I tweet uh, almost exclusively about uh, mental health stuff. No pictures of cats, I promise. So we're going to be talking about self-harm uh, and suicide. And I'm going to start by saying that this is a triggering subject for some, and I would be burying in my head in the sand if I thought that this wasn't relevant to some of you on a very personal level. So I have no doubt in a group of over a hundred medical students that some of you may have self-harmed historically, some of you may be self-harming, some of you may have had or currently have suicidal thinking because these things are not uncommon and they are more common in people under psychosocial stresses and medical school is a stressful experience as well as for most a very enjoyable one. This isn't something that's traditionally been covered in medical school curricula, topics around self-harm. And so I think it's good that we're doing that. It's hugely important. And I want to give you just one of the many resources out there which relate to this sort of risk. So SHOUT is a, a national helpline which you can text for support 24 hours a day, uh, particularly if you're feeling suicidal. And, and never please feel that there is nobody out there uh, to listen if you're feeling at risk to yourselves there is always a and e and there are a range of emergency helplines you can contact plus uh, we have specific support from the university of exeter medical school and uh, some of the student support team are online for this lecture so they'll be listening in and they'll be um, awaiting any contact if somebody wanted to speak to, with them afterwards via the usual channels so with that bit out of the way um, Let's talk about why this might be a difficult subject. And this is what I present when I'm talking to my paediatric colleagues about how they approach uh, risk assessments. And I think all of us, unless we've had uh, training or practice in this, might feel naturally reluctant to ask about risk. So this is what might go through our mind consciously or unconsciously. What if I don't know what to ask or how to ask it? What if they, the patient or the Indeed, the, the family or those around them don't want to talk about their feelings, which will likely be complex. What if they say something that scares or upsets me? So if you are an individual who has yourself uh, harmed yourself or had thoughts of suicide, what's that like being in the room with someone else who might talk about that? What if the patient asks me a personal question in response? And that's probably a topic for, for a different lecture, but we try and be boundaried as much as we can at the same time it's important to be human and you will find that you develop a practice around how much you're willing to speak about yourself with your patients what if i don't know the right answer 
Well, welcome to psychiatry, where there are rarely right answers um, or one particular viewpoint. So um, especially when someone is in a mental health crisis, um, it's very rare that there is one thing you can do or say that will be the right thing. More commonly, there will be a group of responses and interventions that come together in a holistic way to have meaning for that patient. It is a fallacy to think there must be someone better placed to ask about these things. And I include here examples where medical students have been along to talk to patients on the psychiatric ward, on the paediatric ward, um, who have gleaned really important information around risk. And they clearly have had not, not more training than the mental health team um, involved. If there is an opportunity to speak to a patient with this sort of um, psychiatric presentation, please make sure that you clear that with the clinical team before you go to talk with them. And please make sure that you have a space to debrief thereafter. There's quite a lot of language that's very important around risk and particularly suicide, and I want to bring that to the fore early on. Please avoid the following terms. Committing suicide. Does anyone want to put in the chat function? Because I'd like this to be interactive if we can. Why, why I might encourage you to avoid that particular term, committing suicide. Because it tends to be something that would just roll off the tongue. And indeed, you see it a lot in, um, in the media, in the press, people talk it like that. So Jaunty says makes it sound like a sin. Um, and committing implies it's a crime. Good. Eva says the same thing. Thanks, Joe and Eva. You're right. So uh, suicide used to be a crime. Um, we're going back quite a long way here, but this harks back to the idea that this was, um, yes, something sinful, something immoral to make an attempt on your life. And we've come quite a long way, clearly. We now understand um, the significance of mental health problems and we're improving the stigma around this. And yet we continue to use this term committing suicide. But So I'd encourage you to use something different. Uh, for example, made an attempt to end their life um, or, or the patient expresses a wish to be dead rather than commit suicide. And, and the same goes for the description of a successful attempt. Well, suicide can never be something that you know, we would describe as successful. Sometimes people might talk about a completed suicide, but this language is hugely important. Alongside with self-harm, people reflexively talking about a patient who might be attention seeking by presenting themselves to hospital. Uh, this is this is pejorative. This is unnecessary, unhelpful. Um, occasionally, we would use terms um, like care seeking behaviour, perhaps for a patient who is repeatedly coming to the emergency department um, with a, a degree of suicidality or parasuicidality, where the intent doesn't seem to be to significantly harm them or end their life, but it does seem to be around um, involving professionals in their care and, and seeking support. So care seeking is better than attention seeking, if at all, to use such expressions. I want to put it to you that the the majority of people who self harm aren't actually uh, mentally ill. Many of them will be, but if we look at the child and adolescent population where where I particularly focused, um, a small number of people who self harm as adolescents will go on to have enduring mental health needs. By which I mean severe mental illnesses like um, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, severe depression, and we only need to look at the frequency of self-harm in young people at the minute, which is unfortunately very high, to understand that it's not the case that all of them will go on to be diagnosed with mental illnesses. Also, another important thing to remember, um, or for me to assert, is that self-harm itself is not the issue. Self-harm isn't a diagnosis. Um, and what's more important when we're making these assessments is, yes, understanding the risk in play, but also what has happened to get a young person or an adult to the point where they are self-harming? What is the cause of this behaviour and what's the intent behind it? And that's part of the risk assessment. Um, because if we take overdose, for example, I might see one day of the week a young person who's taken 200 ibuprofen but actually this might have been um, at something done on the spur of the moment with no concept that that could be harmful, just a sort of reactive uh, response to a family argument. And the next day I might see a young person who's taken perhaps only six paracetamol, but they genuinely felt that that might um, end their lives. 
So there's an important distinction there in terms of um, what people are intending when they harm themselves. So it would be really helpful if people could um, engage with this. And I know this is a difficult subject, but what I'd like to know is um, what have people found works well in their personal experience of talking to others about self-harm? Because I would be staggered to find that uh, there aren't many of you who have needed to have these conversations with your family and uh, perhaps, perhaps your, your friends. So I'm going to try and get back to my view where I can see your comments. Who'd like to start us off? What, what works well in terms of having these conversations with people? I'm going to come out of the slideshow for a second. There we are. Listening. Thank you, Molly. Being specific about what you mean. Did you intend to end your life, etc.? Thank you, Hannah. Allowing the patient to express their experiences in their own words, then using those. I really like that. Thank you very much. Giving them time to open up. It won't be easy for them to do so. Excellent. So one of the immediate themes there is around uh, language, isn't it? So silence is OK. Thank you, Hannah. So leaving um, adequate space for a patient to express themselves in their own words. I really like using their own words. That's a really good point because um, it demonstrates that you're listening carefully and it also means you're using uh, language that's that's most helpful for that patient. Thank you, that's really good. And the second question here is, is how would you want the patient to describe your approach? So can you give me some words in the chat bar now that if you'd come away from a consultation that was about self-harm, you would like to know that your patient had felt about you? What descriptive terms? I'll start you off with a sentence. So that consultation was helpful because the doctor there we are, to know that you cared, non-judgmental, empathic, understanding, compassionate. And reassuring, good. So the words you're using here make me feel that you also feel quite, quite confident um, in this consultation. And it's possible to go into a clinical environment feeling pretty uncertain about what's going to happen, maybe feeling um, inadequately prepared for what lies ahead and still for your patient to feel that you have uh, you've understood the situation and you're not thrown by it. Hannah says she'd like um, the, the patients to feel that they'd seen her as a person rather than, uh, oh, seeing the patient as a person rather than illness or actions. Very good. Very good. So I absolutely agree with all of those. Thank you. Um, and I put down a few words here that I, I would like to think that my patients and families th think about me, that I'm calm, knowledgeable, competent, non-judgmental. And you've got all of these already, really. Trustworthy is very important. I think particularly with young people who are talking about self-harm. Might be the first time they've shared it. Uh, it might lead on to um, disclosures about things that have been traumatic or um, abusive in their past. So they've got to feel that this is a clinician who can take on board what they're saying and they're not going to use it in an unhelpful fashion. So throughout this talk, I'm going to talk about some of the principles of how we might conduct a risk assessment. And I want you to, to make some notes on this ideally and, and, and some reflections and then maybe even going away from this um, practice with, with a partner where one of you could pretend to be um, a patient who um, is in crisis, another could really get, get in tune with how you have these conversations. So risk is actually a very broad subject um, and it shouldn't be limited to risk of self-harm and suicide. 
It's also multifactorial. And what I mean by that is it's very rarely the case that um, incident X has led to risk Y. And what we see in, in, in psychiatry is a cooking pot of factors, the biopsychosocial model uh, that comes together, and hopefully you'll, you'll have understood that already, and the 4P model, if you haven't heard of that already. So we talk about the predisposing factors, in a case the precipitating factors, sort of why now, why has this um, come, come to light? Uh, the perpetuating factors, why is this continuing if this is a long-standing problem, and the protective factors, what is it that, that might be helpful for this young person or adult in terms of decreasing suicidal risk? And that's the multifactorial melting pot I'd like to think about. Risk assessments are also very subjective exercises. So whilst we might do a blood test on a patient and all 150 of us might look at the same results and say, oh, well, this patient is anemic because we know that their um, their HB is too low. And that's quite clearly an objective measure of something going on in the body. If all of us went to say to see the same 25 year old who'd, who'd cut themselves, we would come away with a different sense of risk for that person. Um, and you'd expect I'd probably have a um, a more thorough sense of the risk perhaps, but not necessarily actually. And there might be something about that patient um, that is alerting in you, uh, something that you understand better than I do, something cultural, something in terms of the communication. And you'll either like that about psychiatry or, or, you, or you'll hate it. The fact that this is, this is a subjective um, and changeable piece of work. So it's equally the case that risk can be uh, in the morning quite low with a patient and by the afternoon incredibly high, dependent on what has occurred. So things in psychiatry can change actually quite quickly. How we assess risk must be more than a form filling process, by which I mean tick box exercises about what has happened um, historically uh, is not sufficient to understand risk. This is about a conversation, this is about deliberation, and um, it doesn't work if done in a black and white sort of manner. I said that risk is dynamic and we have to engage the patient and indeed those around them in understanding risk, because sometimes a risk will be presented to us um, in a rather one-dimensional fashion by a patient. I'll give you an example, young person on the on, presenting to A&E, a 17-year-old &E, who says, um, I've just wanted to die for the last few weeks, life is terrible, uh, not worth living. And actually a conversation with the school and the parents says that they've been talking a lot about looking forward to um, the, the rugby match of the weekend. And um, they've been engaging in school and um, spending time with their friends and apparently quite relaxed. So there's something there that we need to understand better um, and in the round. There's also a number of real red flags, and we'll come back to those to talk about in terms of what might be considered the highest risk behaviours. So how many types of risk um, can you think of? And I, uh, I've already said um, this goes beyond um, just thinking about self-harm and suicidality. So can you put in the chat function um, anything that you would consider a risk to a person or a patient. Hannah says risk to self and, and risk to others. Very good. So sometimes in psychiatric practice, we find ourselves assessing um, the risk of a patient to someone else, although it's important to say in terms of you understanding about psychiatry, it's really a myth that mental health patients are dangerous. That's not correct. Um, OK, leaving home if they're young. OK, so um, the risk of, um, I suppose, what you might be meaning there is, is homelessness, but also risks around transition from being in a supportive environment to somewhere uh, much more independent. And some of you, uh, you know, your second year of um, medical school, you moved in a pandemic to start a new life in a different part of the country or the world. Uh, it would have been risky for you in, in lots of ways, psychologically, 
but certainly financial risk is a really important one. Marco, thank you for that. So we might think about a patient with a manic episode who is um, spending thousands of pounds online with, with gambling or, um, you know, an, an, uh, um, an idea that they have, um, which might be driven by some delusional thoughts. So yes, financial risks is important. Anything else in terms of risk we want to share? Safeguarding risks in children, excellent. So risks from others. Um, and that doesn't just apply to children, you know, there are safeguarding of adults. So if you are a 50 year old with chronic schizophrenia who is struggling to 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 function and needing and needing care from that point of view, or if you are an 11 year old with an acute anxiety disorder, not leaving the house, not attending school. These are people who might be at risk from others in a safeguarding sense. That's fantastic. Thank you, Joe. So I'll go back to presenting these. Actually, there are there are tons of risks, really. Harm to self, harm from others, and we might list the various forms of, of abuse there. Harm to others. And in forensic psychiatry, some of the red flags include things like uh, harming animals and um, arson. So things like um, dissocial personality disorder, uh, psychopathy can be related in early life with, with those sorts of things. We see them rarely. Hollywood will show you them more often than others, but um, uh, hurting animals is always a concern when I hear about that. Risks of exploitation because of vulnerability, risks of self-neglect. So um, I have a patient at the minute who hasn't showered for a couple of weeks um, because of, of a set of ideas around the risks around that. Um, weight loss. Risk of deterioration in mental state. So when we're conducting a Mental Health Act assessment to determine whether a patient should be detained under the Mental Health Act, it is a consideration to think if we don't intervene at this point, um, are we likely to see a deterioration? Homelessness we've talked about, um, accidents and misadventure. That's really important. So again, a patient who might be in a hypermanic or manic state, acting impulsively, not sleeping, driving too fast, um, taking drugs and so on. Risks to occupation, education and reputation. So what if in the course of somebody being uh, very ill, they damage their standing in society or um, their, their relationships or they um, perhaps fall out of college because they haven't been treated for this problem. Financial we've talked about, psychological and it goes on. So I wanted to show you that risk is actually a broad subject and much bigger than and simply self-harm. So what's my role as, as a psychiatrist? Well, psychiatrists are doctors in mental health, as you understand. So um, our, some of our principal roles include diagnosing mental illness. And of the young people that I see who self-harm, and I see a very large number because of the role that I'm in, I, I lead the risk assessment service, um, it's actually much more common that I would come away having seen a young person who's taken an overdose, determining actually this isn't mental illness, than it is that I come away thinking this is a severe depression or um, a psychotic disorder or so on. I wonder if that would surprise you as a group to hear that. Um, but it's possible to have emotional, psychological distress in the absence of, of mental illness. Psychiatrists, of course, um, prescribe medication and they're, they're the ones within mental health teams who would do that and medications can really help reduce risk and I've had plenty of patients in my career who've been um, self-harming or, or very suicidal who with the right treatments of talking therapies um, and medication have, have made good recoveries and then stopped those acts. The medical role of the psychiatrist is also with liaison with the physical health teams and those who have um, made it into hospital by virtue of their self-harm uh, need a liaison sort of response. We are always involved when cases are particularly um, particularly difficult um, and certainly when there are kind of forensic questions. Um, but psychiatrists don't have a magic wand. Um, nobody does in these kind of cases actually. Um, and often our role is to say, well look, there's a component to this that relates to um, psychiatry maybe, but there might be a much bigger role for social care. And we might also talk to families about the fact that 
if the self-harm has been quite long-standing in a young person um, or an adult, it's unlikely to just disappear overnight. So we need to modify risk and reduce it over the course of time. I've highlighted this slide because I think it's um, perhaps the most important, um, certainly at your stage. So talking about suicide and self-harm does not increase the likelihood of a patient um, acting in this manner or put thoughts into their heads. And this has been um, statistically um, shown because there have been historically some concern that this might be possible. So what if you ask a 15 year old, are you thinking about killing yourself? That doesn't implant that idea and make it more likely that then we would see a suicide attempt. So what should you do? Well, um, you should be human and yourself. Several of you have mentioned listening and sympathy uh, and offering hope as well, um, if possible, even if at your, um, your relatively junior stage in your training, if you were to meet um, a patient who'd self-harm to say, um, I understand that there's lots of patients who will get better even when they're in this despairing sort of position as you are. And perhaps you haven't seen that, but you understand it from others and you know that psychiatry as a specialty wouldn't exist, for example, unless recovery is possible. A really good question in the moment, and not just in, in psychiatry and this particular area of psychiatry, but in all of medicine, is to ask, what can I do to support you right now? And that acknowledges the fact that there's unlikely to be um, an immediate solution, as we've discussed. And um, it puts it out to the patient that they can be somewhat directive with what they think is going to improve things for them. That might even be, do you know what, I'm, I'm just really hungry. I haven't eaten for two days. Can you get me some hospital toast? And unless you ask that sort of question, what can I do to support you right now? You won't know what the very basic things that are required. Think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, which traditionally now has Wi-Fi, doesn't it, at the bottom. Um, actually, safety and attending to hunger and, and, and shelter are the most important. So if we meet a young person out on the, on the street, the police have been called to and apparently they're, they're suicidal. Well, actually, if they're street homeless, maybe the thing that they need is shelter for tonight because they've been cold, they've been vulnerable, they're scared. And that's driven them to feeling that life isn't worth living any longer. Don't. It's very easy to say don't appear shocked and I'm going to show you a slide in, in, in a few minutes which I think might be a bit shocking in terms of self-harm. Um, but, but, but it's important that you, that you hold yourself in a manner that um, the patient wouldn't think that you've been, been disgusted or horrified by what's happened, that you're not judging them. Um, don't blame yourself. That might seem a strange one for you to, 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 to see there. But if we see a patient in a psychiatry clinic um, and within a few hours they've taken an overdose and ended up in A&E, um, that is not necessarily a product of anything that I've done or said or not said. Um, but these are powerful emotional experiences, so that can, um, that can be something that bubbles up. Don't promise confidentiality, particularly with uh, those under 18. Uh, because confidentiality can never be absolute, by which I mean a young person or an adult might say something to you so concerning that you might need to involve the police or social care or safeguarding. So please don't, when you're on your psychiatric placements, say, you know, you can tell me anything, I won't tell any anyone around you. Socratic questioning. So those of you who've heard me lecture before would have heard of this idea. Um, Socrates was a great thinker and philosopher. And he said to get to the bottom of any complex subject, you should do that through questioning. To get to the truth of things, to open up issues and, and problems. And examples of this are how we make uh, shared thinking and, and make it critical with one another. So if a um, 16 year old says to me, my life is hopeless, it's not worth winning, I'm going, I'm going to kill myself. Um, I could take that on face value or I could invite them to say a bit more. Can you, can you expand on what you what you mean by that? Um, do you have plans? Do you have details? Uh, tell me what you're thinking exactly. If they say I want to be dead, I need to know, well, is that right now in the last two hours since you've come to A&E or, you know, how are you feeling a, a few days ago? Is it always the case that you want to be dead? 
because that can open up a conversation actually about hope and change and difference. Requesting evidence. So the patient that says, um, I'm, I'm hopeless, everyone wants me to, dead, to be dead. Well, how do you respond to that? You respond through helping the patients to open that a bit broader. Why, why is it that you say that? I'm sorry to hear that. Why do you say that? Um, and also getting the, 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 the patient to think, well, what's the, what are the implications of this self-harm? You know, um, what, what, what's happening as a result of this? Is it the case that um, this seems to be sort of pushing people away from you? Or actually, is it drawing people in? Uh, might it be that since you started self-harming, um, actually, a great aunt has moved into the house and now mum has stopped work and actually people are attending to that person in a different way. Questioning the questions, brilliant. You love this as a classic psychiatry sort of response, but I, I actually do this quite often. I will ask a young person a question and I will follow it up, especially that if they're struggling to find an answer with why do you think I asked that? Why is that important for us to think about? I will focus briefly on CAMS, partly because it's my area of expertise and also it's very topical. Um, these figures are actually from a couple of years ago when I first gave this lecture. And um, sadly, uh, I would say they are out of date now um, because we've had updated prevalence studies which show uh, that self-harm is more common than this. But I think it's safe to assume that in every secondary school classroom, um, there is a, a whole host of young people who have hurt themselves in various ways. And at age 14 years, 25% of girls would experience suicidal ideation. I think that's incredibly sad and worrying because I'm not sure what that um, can tell us about the world that we're living in. Very few uh, young people who, who self-harm will present to, to services. And that means there's a huge number um, who remain unknown. Some have estimated that up to 50% of those under 18 uh, will have had self-harmed in some way. And I put not just girls here because it tends to be um, in my field of work in CAMS that the majority of young people who come to the ward um, having, for example, cut themselves or taken overdoses are girls. But actually, there's a large number of boys who might present to A&E having punched a wall. And historically, we might have thought of that as, oh, well, there's, you know, it's a boy just being frustrated and angry. But that is also a form of self-harm the boxers fracture um, across the hand. And um, they should be managed in, in exactly the same way, I think, as a patient who has um, cut themselves. Um, I can't show this Animated Minds video because of the fact we're doing this remotely. If we were all together post pandemic, I would, but you can have a look online for Animated Minds and they do a really good range of um, uh, animated shorts around things, including one on um, self-harm, which is well, very worth seeing. So there are narratives around self-harm and um, I'm going to read a little bit of this. This is written by um, a teenager. When asked to to write down what relationship they have with self-harm. I hate my life, but I'm to blame. Hurting myself keeps me tame watching the blood rush from my arm. This is the life, the life of self-harm. The first cup is also always so deep, but I feel so much better seeing the blood seep. It's graphic, isn't it? And it's, um, it's quite disturbing, really. I feel all alone in my own little world. What's happening to me? I was a sweet little girl. Everything is wrong. Nothing goes right, relieving my pain in the dead of night. I wear long jumpers so no one can see what I've been doing to poor old me. All this pain is just in my head, it doesn't seem to go, and I wish I were dead. All of this hurt surely must end, maybe I can get help from one of my friends. But what will they think of this silly little girl always suffering in her own little world? What are people's immediate responses to, to hearing that? I'm going to shift back to the um, chat function now. Be brave in offering your views. We'll take it as read that everyone thinks that that's sad. Is it worrying? Very low self-esteem, Jasmine has said. Thank you, that's really helpful. 
Sad to see how isolated she feels. Aisha, thank you. Do people feel hopeless reading that or belittling herself since the girl doesn't have any hope for anything? Anna says incredibly self-aware, which is quite powerful. That's really interesting. So um, very reflective, isn't it? Very insightful about her own th feelings. Sometimes we use a term for people who struggle to do that it's called alexithymia. A being an absence of lexi words, thymia, mood. So this young person versus another who might, when I ask, you know, how are you feeling? Tell me a bit about yourself and the self-harm. They just say, I don't know. This is actually a young person who's got really good sense of exploration, I think. Um, not seen by anyone else that she's suffering. Thank you. So I agree. It sounds like this is a young person who's probably self-harming, uh, you know, alone in their bedroom or at school, that sort of story. And, and that, that's a real worry because it makes us think, well, who is actually aware of what's going on? It's a young person not even telling their friends, probably not their family. So there are risks with that, um, more so than, than a young person whom we know to be um, talking to, to teachers and so on. So we go to speak to this young person and I'm going to put it to you that you need to be courageous, really. Um, I won't do it a sort of poll, but if I asked you how many of you would be confident going to talk to this 15 year old, um, I can imagine that probably no one would feel completely confident, but maybe, I don't know, a fifth or a third of you would think, yeah, I could give this a good crack. I can talk to this child about what's going on. So young people um, and adults, I would suggest as well, some can report that their, their self-harm or suicidal feelings can initially make their situation worse if they talk about them. And that might be some of the reluctance to, for example, having your, patient, your, your parent become aware that you are harming yourself. Um, and particularly in the case of uh, safeguarding um, issues, um, it can lead to more worry and distress for the young person. But invariably, I say to young people, it's good to talk about these things. It's good for us to be aware of what is going on in your life so we can help with it. But children and young people, that's CYP, often worry about the reaction they'll get from professionals. And this can be something that is um, a block to them talking openly. Uh, so, you know, last time I went to A&E, uh, the doctor just said I, I was silly and this wasn't even proper self-harm and I should just go home. That is not a helpful response, clearly, in terms of letting this young people person explore what's going on for them. Why do children and young people self-harm? So acts of self-harm can be symptoms of distress rather than, as I said, um, signs of, of mental illness. I've talked about the importance of the act uh, and, it, and its meaning. And so it's really key that we don't generalise about young people who self-harm. And there could be two young people with almost exactly the same looking set of um, cuts or patterns of overdosing who have very different life stories and um, are doing it for very different reasons. For many, especially the young people, this is a method of coping um, with the world. And the increase in self-harm and restricted eating and suicidality during this pandemic, I think, has been driven by the loss of control. So young people have lost structure in life. They've lost predictability. They've, lo they've lost safety. The sense of you can't even go out of your house without feeling unsafe. Um, is a hugely powerful thing to consider, I think, um, for, you know, for adults as well as young people. And young people have been shut away and struggling with their, their inner world. And they might find that they felt rather numb or low or empty. And unfortunately, it can be to a degree addictive, not in the way that people get withdrawal from opiates. Um, but this is can be kind of self-reinforcing. So there's a cycle here of self-harm. How negative emotions um, lead to a sense of um, tension or frustration, of feelings of being unable to cope. The self-harm for some young people, they say, well, I, I find it helps me. And they get a release of endorphins 
and for a short period of time, the negative feelings might go. It's incredibly rare for young people and adults to say, I enjoy self-harm. I have heard it and I usually challenge it. I usually say, is that really what you mean? Um, because for the most part, this isn't an enjoyable experience. People don't come to A&E with frequent self-harm because they think it's fun. This isn't enjoyable. Unfortunately, after the self-harm, there's normally then um, waves of, of, of guilt and, and shame um, and often the repercussions, especially for young people, of the reaction from parents and, and peers and so on. And then that compounds the negative emotions at the start. I'm going to touch on intellectual disabilities because this area isn't thought about all that much when it comes to self-harm. But people with severe learning disabilities, LD, can um, display what could be perceived by others as self-harming behaviours. Um, and sometimes he's described as self-injurious behaviour. But there are other functions of this behaviour to consider. So this might be an act very similar to someone without a learning disability, but quite commonly um, they are about uh, sensory stimulation. So to compensate for feeling over or under stimulated. Um, and so young people who might hit or bite themselves, um, I can think of examples of people in um, learning disability, residential settings who have a tendency to, to headbang, for example. But that might be about um, not feeling understood or not being able to communicate. Or it might be a mechanism, the best that they have, of um, describing a problem. For example, that repeated hitting on the side of the head, which could be seen as self-harm, but actually draws attention, the doctor's attention, the parent's attention to the fact that there, there's something going on, there's pain here that they can't express. In terms of risk factors, um, there are, is some evidence around genetic risk factors for, for suicidality. So that might be because, well, we know that mental health disorders um, have a genetic um, pre predisposition, lots of them. And sometimes I meet families in, in whom there is a very strong story of severe depression, for example, um, or psychotic illnesses. But there's also some, some evidence about the heritability of aggression. And aggression, we normally think, is a term about aggression towards others. But acts of self-harm are aggression towards the self. So there is some sense of a relationship between serotonin dysregulation and suicidal behaviour. That might be one reason why antidepressants like SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, can help with um, suicidality and indeed why they might in the first initial 24-48 hours cause a slight increase in risk. And um, we always talk to our patients about that and being wary of some initial agitation and for some increased suicidal thinking. However, particularly in young people, it's clear from um, a large number of studies that the suicide rate does not, completed suicide rate, does not go up on initiation of these medications. There have been some genes studied here, which I, I can't tell you enough about because I'm not an academic in this sense. Um, but I suppose it's worth you knowing that some of these may be implicated in suicidality. Environmental risk factors, well, there, there are many really, and you may have heard me separately uh, talk about adverse childhood experiences. If you've never heard that term, ACE, please do go away and look it up. Um, we now know that statistically, the more adverse childhood experiences a young person has, uh, the rates of mental illness and risks of self-harm and suicidality are multiplied significantly and in a way that's not surprising but there are 10 well-known adverse childhood experiences such as um, mental illness in a parent such as abuse um, parental separation and so on and risk factors in terms of availability of a means of, of, of suicide so i am more concerned about the young person who lives right next to a train track or lives on a coastal area next to a high cliff. And that is going to modify um, some of my thinking around um, their suicidal risk, especially if they tell me I've been thinking about going to a train track 
well then I want to know from that young person where is the nearest train track and there's quite a difference between living right in the middle of the countryside away from any train to being uh, you know back backing onto a track There are a number of psychological risk factors for this sort of behaviour um, and I would uh, put a few forwards to you. Dichotomous thinking um, and this is sort of the black and white position if you like of life life is terrible therefore I need to die. It's a very binary black or white. There's no grey area of things are really hard at the minute but perhaps they might improve. Um, people who have an external locus of control, this sense that, well, everything always happens to me, rather than a sense of having some, some agency and impaired problem solving. Well, that might be because of difficulties with executive function. It might be also um, to do with, with other learning needs and so on. And their personality characteristics. Well, these are a bit difficult to disentangle because they might relate to the mental illness itself, um, but they are important in assessing risk. So what does self-harm look like? I'm going to show a slide now which demonstrates some self-harm and if you want to look away now because it's going to be triggering for you then by all means do. Um, I've been given permission to show this slide by the patient I looked after some years ago in an inpatient unit. And I'm going to ask you as a group um, to put in the chat what questions you would have for this young person when looking, this is their arm by the way, um, when looking at this. So I need to now see my chat. Oh, I see there's some comments here. Thank you. Um, is Pika counted as self-harm? I'll just cover this one from Hannah whilst other people are typing some things. Well, no, so Pika is when um, usually very young kids eat unusual substances like um, wallpaper and soil um, and that is as a consequence in PICA of nutritional deficiencies so they're trying to get um, iron and so on into their into their bodies so they get this drive to do that. Um, some adults might eat unusual things and I suppose that could be a method of self-harm but that wouldn't be considered to be PICA. Um, I mean I've looked after patients in the last few years who've swallow batteries and razor blades and that sort of thing but pica is specific to nutritional deficiencies um, do you ever explore feelings through other mediums such as art or music with people expressing difficulties uh, with expressing themselves um, yeah abso abs absolutely um, and not everyone is going to be a good candidate for talking therapies but we should have services that can adapt and demonstrate um, you know other, other options so no one's posted any questions here but believe me you need to have questions for this young person how are you going to start with asking about this and indeed how are you going to prevent yourself from a reacting in a horrified fashion OK, good. So how long have you been self-harming? And I think we can see from the um, the nature of these cuts that these are, you know, healed over a long period of time, aren't they? How did they do that? Very good, Marco. So, you know, what did, what did they use? Why did they do it? Really nice open question. They may not have an answer to that, but demonstrate that you're interested in knowing. What do you do afterwards? How often? Good. And Hannah takes us right back to the beginning. Tell us about yourself. Tell me about yourself. Excellent, because you could walk into the clinical encounter and say, oh gosh, gosh, look at your arm, tell me about that. And, or you could say, I see that we've got a conversation we need to have about your arm, but before we do that, I need to know about you as an individual. Um, what does the X mean at the bottom? Okay, so um, <clears throat> one of your colleagues has spotted that there's a very small um, sort of self-made tattoo there, but yeah, what's the meaning of it? Good, how does it make you feel? Is there something that happens that prompts you to do this? Good. So these are all really Im important um, considerations. I'm going to go on to the next slide so that if people want to, to turn back, they can. But asking to see self-harm is really important. So any patient who says to you, um, I'm cutting on my arms, they come to their GP to discuss that. Please ask them to if they will show you. They, they may choose not to. 
and you may have to respect that. But there's a big difference between the sort of arm I've just shown now and very superficial um, scratching, really, in terms of risk. So these are the questions I would ask this young person, and indeed I did. Um, what, what do you use? The difference between a clean razor blade taken out of the packet every time versus um, a rusty bit of metal hidden under a bed. Um, do you clean it after you? So how are you attending to, to yourself properly? Where do you store the item once it's been used? Who knows about it? So that's about how we're going to manage and plan this risk assessment. Um, do you have bandages at home? So traditionally, um, A&E departments and GP surgeries don't give out bandages for people who are self-harming, you know, for next time. And I find that quite staggering, really, because we should be doing that. That is a holistic response in terms of caring for 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 a patient, but we don't. And I think some people would say something like, oh, well, it would encourage them to do it again. I mean, come on, um, let's practice good, thoughtful medicine. Have you tried alternatives to self-harm? So um, things like using rubber bands to to flick against the against the wrists. Um, ice diving is quite a good one. I often talk with young people about filling a big bowl up with water, lots of ice and thrusting the head inside it. Um, it has quite an invigorating and shifting um, view. It's a good distraction. Uh, there's a lot of grounding techniques people can use to avoid self-harm. So when you're feeling distressed, think of five things you can see, feel, um, hear uh, to bring somebody back into the present, because often people are quite dissociated when they do this. And do you wish to stop self-harming? Really important question. What's this young person's relationship with with help. So somebody said right at the beginning, and thank you for that, we, we shouldn't be ambiguous. Um, and we need to say something along the lines of, gosh, I can see what's what's happened to your arm here. Um, oh, but, and by the way, there were burn marks there at the bottom, um, done with a lighter, the edge of the lighter when it gets hot. That's what that was fun. Um, I would ask this young person also, is there anything else that I need to, to should see on your body that relates to risk? And be really clear um, that it might be that you are feeling pretty desperate and are there times that you've thought about ending your life, for example? So asking about these things, demonstrate that you, that you care and you want to know and you want to help. Sometimes when I'm giving this talk, people will ask, well, is, what's the kind of um, scientific approach to this? What tools can I use? And I've already said that checklists are poor um, and they have a very poor predictive value. Predictive value meaning being able to say what is going to happen next, really. Um, they tend to miss the point because they become somebody with a box like this rather than somebody engaged with the person. And they can be frustrating for everyone. However, your documentation of the medical legal situation is really extremely key and being clear in, in that regard. So I tend to use, especially with young people, uh, simple uh, numeric scales to help people make a judgment around their around their mood and their suicidality. So you've maybe come across this idea before of saying on a scale of 0 to 10, how are you feeling? But being really explicit about, well, what do I mean by 10 out of 10 and 0 out of 10? It'd be easy to get those things the wrong way around, actually, as well, um, in, the, in your patient's head. And how strange, would anyone ever have thought about this question? How much do you want to be alive as a percentage? I mean, very strange, isn't it? Is that scientific? No, not really. Is it a springboard to a conversation about how we would get them from 10% to 50% and thereafter to improve it? So these are about how you initiate conversations about abstract topics. There are some acronyms out there, but this is just if you like this kind of thing, really. Um, it's a bit like the ones that exist for um, alcohol dependency, for example. And you could Google this one, the, the, the pathos approach. Um, it sort of just looks to establish how long the problem has been going, going on for, um, where it occurred um, when the act of self-harm or, or suicidal attempt um, happened, the degree of planning. Hopelessness is actually a really important um, risk assessment tool. So people feel hopeless about the future, the chances of them acting in a significantly risky manner um, are important. But like I said earlier, I often see young people who tell me 
on a Thursday morning they want to be dead, but actually they're going to um, a gig on Saturday night they're really looking forward to. And that leads me to conversations of, well, actually, you know, what does it mean to be dead then? What's exactly you're describing to me? Um, our patients' histories in psychiatry are, are what we do. They're our examination and we depend on them completely. But we have to be cautious about how we interpret statements. So sometimes patients will say something like, I'm fine now, I wouldn't do it again. But that's a very basic response to a complicated situation. And I'm always cautious when I hear that there's been an immediate resolution of suicidality because it calls into question whether that has actually happened. Um, and to be honest, if somebody comes to hospital having tried to end their lives and actually all they're thinking about is I need to get out of here so I can try again, they're not going to tell the professional, generally speaking, um, about what their plan is. So we need to approach this with, with caution. Is their report consistent with the action undertaken? So um, the 30 year old man who goes to the woods with a, a piece of rope um, and is actively and hanging when a member of the public cuts him down and then says, no, I'm fine, uh, I just want to go home. Uh, that's a very significant, very potentially lethal action. And um, I'd be really concerned and I wouldn't take that report at face value, to be honest. So does the collateral history, those around the person support what they're saying and what has changed? So if a patient tells you actually it's different now, I'm not going to do this again. What's different? Maybe you've had a really good interaction with the family of the young person and, and, and they feel relieved. So maybe that is OK. And, you know, we get them home very straightforwardly. Um, but I would want to know what's changed if the risk has apparently changed. How do you feel now about what's happened? Is a good question. When did you decide to do X? Gives you a sense of impulsivity versus planning and what have been the consequences? Might you do it again? So we're almost at the hour um, and I'm going to have a think about um, if any of these other slides are, are essential really. But what I want to do is just invite um, some questions because we've covered quite a lot there. Um, and it's been, uh, it's difficult. OK, so um, Hannah says, how often do people claim to have self-harmed to cover up abuse? So that's interesting. I guess what you mean is a sort of adult who comes with bruising on their arm and says it's self-inflicted. Um, I've never seen that. Never, but I think it'd be really important to be mindful of it and, and thoughtful about it. I mean, there's patterns of um, of bruising that would be more suggestive of something like domestic violence occurring. Um, but clearly, yes, I mean, a finger finger marks of a bruise like this could be self-inflicted or they could be from someone grabbing at you. What are the questions that people have? Or reflections and feel free to say, look, this has been a horrible talk. I wish we hadn't had it or. Um, you know, it's good we're talking about this. What, what do you think? Hi, Rory. I sorry, I'm easier to, to possibly yeah. say this one. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for this so far. It's been really interesting. Um, I guess so with with other areas of medicine, patient choice is a big part of it. Um, in terms of kind of deciding where their treatments go. Ultimately, is there any kind of reason why patients aren't allowed to commit suicide? Is that a, you know, it? <laughs> why is it that medical professionals or, or people in general, you know, people aren't aren't allowed to, or, or we see it as, as not a valid choice? Um, yeah, well, that's... And I know that's a really, just a kind of worm, but <laughs> it's, a big, it's a big question. It's an important philosophical one. Uh, there are cultural components to this. Um, if you go to Japan, for example, uh, there is some. So I've never worked or lived in Japan, but I do understand um, it's viewed slightly differently. And men going I didn't understand oh, that. Men men going off into woodlands to kill themselves can be seen as honourable. Um, I guess the thing is we don't allow people to do it. Um, when it is a product of a treatable mental illness. 
And I say you don't allow it, you know, unfortunately, suicides occur. So we can't prevent all of them. Some people believe there should be a, a drive towards zero suicides. Um, I think it's a bit like saying, um, well, if somebody um, has cancer and they don't want treatment, well, that's fine if they have capacity to decide that. And um, the difference in mental health is that capacity might be impaired by virtue of a mental illness which is treatable. So, you know, I think it's a it's a big that's a big topic, isn't it? Um, but generally speaking, yes, it is considered that people um, shouldn't end their lives if it is related to illness. Um, I'm going to have time for maybe one more question, then we're going to have to end. I'm afraid. Um, let's see. How do you manage transference, or like the heaviness you would feel after these discussions? It's a really good question. What you actually mean here is is counter transference. Transference is what our patients feel about us. Counter transference. Um, is what we feel about them and the scenario, and this can be very um, evocative. The heaviness you feel, that's a great word, heaviness. Um, it can be upsetting, certainly, and, and stressful, but actually someone has to do this work and it can be really rewarding. Uh, it's a lot of meaning in terms of hearing um, about people's lives in this way. Um, so I guess I manage it through um, supervision, through talking with peers, um, my wife's a doctor, that helps. And um, yeah, you get accustomed to it without being numbed to it, I would say. Um, right, I think we're gonna have to end because I will always enthusiastically go over my time. And I um, really appreciate um, the interactions we've had, thank you. I'll just say again, um, please do speak with student support if this has been a troubling thing for you to listen to. And please do seek out help if you are feeling at risk to yourself. Have a lovely Friday and I'm hoping this will be available to you as a recording soon enough. Take care.